today we're going to talk about quantum mechanics. And so this is the physics of very small things. And when I talk about very small things, I mean like things the size of atoms or small. So we, what we did last time was rel special relativity, which was the physics of things that are moving very fast. So now we're doing the physics of things that are very small. And so these are both uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics are physics that we don't have a lot of experience with in our everyday lives. And so some of the things that we're gonna talk about don't match with what we perceive in our everyday life. Um, and just as an aside, so, so I said special relativity is the physics of things moving quickly. Uh, these two things can play well together. So you might have something that's quantum and moving very quickly. And so that field of study is quantum electrodynamics. But then what doesn't play well together is quantum and general relativity, which we didn't have time to talk about in this class. Uh, but you can just think about general relativity as gravity. And so gravity and quantum mechanics do not play well together. And so what I mean by that is scientists have tried to develop a theoretical framework that includes both of those things. And so far, none of them have been successful. So if you do that, you get a Nobel prize kind of thing. Uh, but that's not really important. Uh, what is important for right now is to just know that these quantum and which we're about to talk about and special relativity which we talked about last time, do uh, you can develop a theoretical framework where both of those things are in agreement. Okay. So let's start talking about the physics of very small things. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is quantization of energy. And so what we mean by quantized is discrete amounts. And what we mean by discrete is not continuous. So instead of like, some kind of machine where you could just turn a dial and get any kind of number you want out of it. When we study, say for example, the energy of an atom, which we'll talk about in a minute, what we see is that 
you can only measure certain amounts of energy. You can't like, if your energy scale went from one to two, you would expect to be able to measure any decimal between one and two. But what we see is that there's only certain values between one and two that we can measure. And the equation that governs that is the following. So the energies that we're able to measure follow this relationship. So this is the energy. N is kind of like the M that we saw with the single and double slit interference, only now it's only positive. So N goes from zero up to infinity. So any integer that's positive and zero. F is a frequency. And H is a new constant. This is called Planck's constant. And it has the following value. And the units are joules times seconds. And so this equation, when it was first discovered, was specifically for light, light having some frequency f. Uh, but as we'll see later on, uh, matter also can behave like a wave, and so matter can also have a frequency. And so this equation would also apply to atoms and things like that. And so another example of this quantization of energy So if we did like a continuous picture versus a quantized picture, in a continuous picture, you might be, you could picture just walking up a hill and you could take any kind of step that you wanted to, to get up the hill. You could take big steps, you could take little steps, however you wanna go about it. And a quantized picture, you have the same elevation change, but now to get to the top, you have stairs that have a set height that you need to go up each step. And so in our normal world experience, we would, we assumed that energy was continuous, but then uh, when we got better at measuring things, we discovered that energy was actually quantized. So now let's take a brief detour to talk about atomic physics. So remember I said, uh, Quantum mechanics applies to things on the size of atoms. And so there's a whole branch of physics called atomic physics. Uh, but very briefly, I'll just talk about a hydrogen atom. So a hydrogen atom has a proton, a neutron, and an electron somewhere out here. 
And as you might know from chemistry, there are different states that this electron can be in. So there's different uh, energy bands that the electron can be in. And within each energy band, there are different uh, states that the electron can be in. So electrons have things like spin, And they, those can be up or down. And so in this first energy band for a hydrogen atom, there are two possible states for this electron, up or down. And the first band of electrons is capable of holding two electrons. So that should be things that sound familiar to people who have taken chemistry. So how this ties into the quantization that we were just talking about is that if I want to change, so let's say that this is the, I'll just call it band one, and I wanted to, move the electron into band two, it's going to require a certain amount of energy in order to do that. And it's a very specific amount of energy. And so that energy is quantized. So. So from chemistry, do you guys remember, is band one at a higher energy or is band two at a higher energy? So band two is going to be at a higher energy. And so this atom would need to absorb some energy from somewhere. And the way that it's going to absorb that energy is by a photon interacting with this atom. So to get this precise amount of energy, uh, basically a photon interacts with the atom. If it has the correct energy, then it can move the electron into the next, or whatever, into a different band, I guess I'll say. Uh, so that's basically called absorption because you're absorbing that uh, photon. And then emission is just that process in reverse. So if my atom is at this higher band two and it transitions to band one, then in order to do that, it will emit a photon at a specific energy, so at a specific wavelength. So maybe I'll write that on the next slide. So emission 
is when a photo or an electron in a higher energy band. emits a photon to drop to a lower energy band. And in physics, systems tend to want to be at the lowest energy state possible. And so this emission can happen spontaneously. So this whole process of absorption and emission is called the photoelectric effect. And so photo meaning light, and then electric meaning electrons. So light interacting with atoms can make the electrons move to different energy bands. And if you were to hit the atom with a high enough energy, you can completely free that electron from the atom. So that's called ionization. called ionization because the initial atom that you started with was neutrally charged. And then once it loses an electron, now it's positively charged. So now it's an ion. So that's why it's called ionization. The, once that electron is freed from the atom, it's gonna be moving. And so there's going to be some kinetic energy associated with that electron. And it's going to be equal to the energy of the incoming photon minus this BE, which is the binding energy. So this is kinetic energy of the electron This is the energy of the photon. Where well, remember the H is the uh, Planck's constant and F is the frequency of the light. And then the BE is the binding energy. So if we think back to our picture of the atom, uh, So we've got this positive charge and this negative charge, and you might think that they would be attracted to each other. Uh, so there's an energy associated with that attraction, and there's also some other uh, interactions that are happening too. And so that this binding energy that we were talking about is a combination of all of those factors that try to keep the electron in the atom. And 
So you have to overcome that energy uh, with this ionizing photon in order to release that electron. Uh, so this energy of the photon that we just saw, HF, you can also write that as HC over lambda. Uh, because we remember we have this relationship between frequency and wavelength and the speed of light. And then an interesting bit of trivia about the photoelectric effect is that this is what Einstein won the Nobel Prize for. So he didn't win it for special relativity or general relativity. He won it for the photoelectric effect. And this photoelectric effect has huge implications both in everyday life and for science. So uh, the current phones that you use are CCDs. And the way that they work is for visible light, when the light hits uh, the sensor in your phone, it's able to free electrons. And those electrons then are measured, like they move through the device. So they, you have moving electrons, moving charge, you have a current. You can measure that current and uh, kind of build backwards to say at a pixel level, I measure this brightness and then build a picture of what you just took as a map of the brightness of each of the pixels in your camera. Uh, so that's one application. Another application is in uh, solar energy. So when a photon of the right energy hits the solar panel, the same kind of thing happens. It uh, frees an electron from the whatever material makes up the solar panel. Now that electron is moving, moving charge is a current, and then we can harvest that current to power our electronic devices. So this is very important for things that we do every day. And so it's important to know. So another aspect of quantum mechanics, and we touched on it a little bit with relativity, is that photons have momentum. So as an aside, in classical mechanics, so what we did in the first semester, momentum just equals m times v. Photons don't have a mass. So you would expect that the momentum of a photon would equal zero. Uh, but that's not the case. And so uh, there's implications for uh, relativity and quantum mechanics. So in relativity, we wrote that the total energy of something was P e squared equals PC squared plus MC squared. And so we did the trick where if the momentum is zero, then you get the famous E equals MC squared equation. Uh, but what if instead we write the, the mass is zero? So if we get rid of the mass, which we would do in the case of a photon, now we get energy equals PC 
So if we were to solve this for P, we would get E over C. And if we use the relationship that we wrote down on the previous slide, that energy equals HC over lambda, so energy equals HC lambda, then we see that the momentum for a photon is H over lambda. And remember H is the Planck's constant and lambda is the wavelength. And you could also write that in terms of the frequency, but we usually just leave it in terms of the wavelength. And so again, this is something that has implications. Uh, so one of the coolest applications of this are solar sail technology. So whenever we try to do space travel, uh, we need to use rockets basically. And the way a rocket works is you push mass out the back to propel yourself forward. Uh, so that obviously has a limitation of you can only travel so far as you have mass to push out the back of you. And especially if you want to uh, stop eventually, uh, like let's say you've managed to get out of the solar system, but you used all of your fuel to do it. Now you have no way to stop wherever you wanna end up. So you either need to bring enough fuel so that you can stop at the end, uh, or you just don't travel very far. So with solar sails, uh, once you get out of off of the earth, you use the momentum of the photons from the sun to push your spaceship away from the sun. So you're getting, it's kind of like uh, you're on a ship and you're using the wind to push your sails, only you're using photons from the sun instead of wind. Then when you get to whatever destination solar system you wanna end up at, uh, you use the photons from that other sun to slow you down. Uh, so it's, it's just an interesting idea where we've come from using wind to push our sails across the ocean and we might use photons to push solar sails uh, out into space. Uh, then the next topic to talk about is, so we talked about um, photons acting like particles and also acting like waves. As it's gonna turn out, matter also exhibits wave particle duality. So it might seem uh, familiar or the way that it's usually taught that uh, we understand part of uh, like photon or not photons, uh, protons and neutrons and electrons as particles. Uh, but we can also think about those things as waves. And so the equation that governs that is this one. This lambda is the de Broglie wavelength. H is the Planck's constant again. And P is the momentum. 
So the, the reason that we don't experience this in everyday life situations is that the, the de Broglie wavelength is really, really small. Uh, so in order to observe this, you have to observe interactions. on very small scales. And like I talked about when we were doing optical microscopes, there's a limit to how small of a scale we can actually observe. So this de Broglie wavelength for most things is so small that we can't really observe the effects with a conventional optical microscope. And the next quantum phenomenon that we'll talk about is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so when we've talked about uncertainties in this class, it's usually been with respect to uh, making measurements in the lab, like you'll measure a distance and you'll say, well, I, my meter stick could only measure so well, and maybe I made some mistakes. So I measured the length of this thing with some plus or minus one centimeter uncertainty. As it turns out from quantum effects, there's a limit to how accurately you can measure things. So there's a relationship between position and momentum where the Uncertainty in your position times the uncertainty in your momentum has to be greater than or equal to this new constant called h bar. And h bar is just the regular Planck's constant divided by four pi. So physicists are lazy. So instead of writing h over four pi over and over again, uh, they just made up a new variable. And it's called H bar because it's got a, a bar through the stem of the H. So I guess we can go ahead and calculate what H bar is. So using H. 6.626 divided by times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 4 pi five. 5.27 times 10 to the negative So the implications of this are kind of weird. So let's say I measure my position so precisely so that my delta x equals zero. So I know exactly where the thing that I measured is. 
what would that make? How would that affect this delta p? So it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna increase. If I want to multiply something by zero and have it be bigger than zero, what does that number have to be? So this has to go towards infinity. So if I very precisely measure the position of something, I have no way of knowing how fast that thing is moving. Or on the, on the flip side, if I measure very precisely how fast something is moving, I have no idea where that thing is. So it's just a very weird uh, consequence of quantum mechanics. And it's something that we don't see in our everyday life because uh, we can't measure things to the precision of uh, this h bar constant. But in quantum systems, you could potentially measure things at very precise uh, distances. And then you get very imprecise uh, momentum measurements. There's another uncertainty relationship between energy and time. So it has the same kind of it looks, looks similar, and it's relating energy and time. So if I measure the energy of something very accurately, uh, then I don't know at what time it had that energy. So another weird quantum effect that I'll talk about is quantum tunneling. So I'll make a graph of energy and position. And then I'll draw something that maybe looks like a roller coaster. So if a particle lives down here, it's in what's called a stable equilibrium. So if I were to give that particle a little bit of energy, it would just go back to the same rest position eventually. So that's what is meant by a stable equilibrium. And let me just label some of these energies. So I'll call that, maybe I'll start from the bottom. Energy one, energy two, and then energy three. So energy two, like I just said, is a stable equilibrium, but energy one is an even lower energy state, right? And like I said earlier, uh, physical systems like to be in the lowest energy state possible. The only way to get this uh, red particle into the E1 energy state 
would be to give it enough energy. Uh, so basically to move particle from energy two to energy one, we need to give particle at least energy greater than or equal to E3 to overcome this hump and then rest reside in energy one, right? So is everyone able to see that from the way I have this drawn? So this is how things would work in classical mechanics, the way I've just described it. In quantum systems, however, we observe quantum tunneling. So what can happen if, for example, this delta x or the, the distance between these two points is very small? What we can see is basically the particle tunneling through this potential barrier and basically spontaneously appearing in this lower energy state. So the particle never gets up to energy E3 to overcome the uh, amount of energy it needs to get into this energy one state. And yet it is able to due to this uh, effect called quantum tunneling. So this has applications in microscopy. So remember I said we have a limit to how uh, small of something we can measure with an optical microscope. Uh, we, however, have developed things called uh, scanning, tunneling, electron microscopes that are able to measure things that are as small as uh, like the size of atoms. So if we were confined to only optical microscopes, then we would definitely not be able to see something as small as a, a molecule or an atom. But with this kind of technology, we're able to see exactly those kinds of things. So that was just a brief overview of some of the weird things that we see in quantum mechanics. And if that's interesting to you, then you should maybe study some more physics. Um, but really the takeaway I want you to see from this is that uh, are the applications that we can use uh, from these weird quantum effects that we observe.